Hello! Welcome to February of 1856, the time when everybody's life changed, because they opened up their monthly installment of Dickens's Little Dorrit, and they read three chapters. Little Mother is the first chapter that you read for this installment, which is a fascinating look at the difference between inside the Marshall Sea and outside the Marshall Sea from the perspective of the sort of kind of creepy at this point, Arthur Clennam. Also in this section, we encounter Maggie, perhaps one of the most sympathetic characters that Dickens ever creates that portrays the signs of physical abuse upon children in terms of development later on. She's the one that calls Little Dorrit Little Mother. And it's poignant to watch the way in which we see the deep impact that Little Dorrit has had on this figure's life. She just enters the text out of nowhere, and suddenly we watch because we're following Arthur the deep way in which Little Dorrit has impacted all of her society. And you see these small moves on Arthur's part where, you know, he tries to help pick up the potatoes, or earlier on he tries to walk on the side of Little Dorrit to protect her from the wind and the rain, and you realize, in fact, that he has no position to do this. She has survived this entire time here, and he is just bundling his way through. And eventually, we move on because he and Little Dorrit have finished their time together, and he decides to go and figure out what's going on. And he goes to perhaps the most infamous institution in all of Dickens' writing. Because Dickens had come up with the Circumlocution Office. People went around saying, even if you haven't read Little Dorrit, you have read the Circumlocution Office. For us living today, we have an advantage that Dickens did not, because we've been to the DMV. And the DMV is as close as you can get to trying to figure out how something works in terms of bureaucracy the amount of red tape that one has to go through. And so we follow Arthur Clennam as he tries to figure this out. He, of course, fails as he rushes back from one building to the other building, back to the building. And I want you to think in particular about the really fun name that Dickens comes up with for the person that heads this office, Tight Barnacle, right? His first name indicating the grip with which he holds onto this system and Barnacle being this object that just grasps onto something. And Dickens develops a metaphor at length in a really kind of creative way when you find those different sections. Another thing to think about in this section is how Clennam keeps saying, I'm from China, and then he'll say, I don't understand how the system works. He's very obviously supposed to be a stranger in a strange land, coming to terms with these new institutions as he struggles to do so. Chapter 11 is a relatively short chapter, serving primarily to remind us of the two lovely jailbirds that we met in the first chapter, Rigaud and Cavaletto. In this, we discover that Rigaud has somehow escaped uh, being beheaded or hanged and is running around in the countryside. He has a fun little monologue with himself, drinks some wine, goes to bed, and, in one marvelous coincidence, discovers that his bedmate is none other than his former prison mate, Cavaletto. He convinces Jean-Baptiste to come and be his servant again in the morning, and Jean-Baptiste goes to bed, fully clothed, only to make a remarkably expected escape in the morning. And we end this month's section with him dashing off into the dawn. Think as you go through these sections about the ways in which the different narratives uh, influence each other. Like, how is Rigaud similar to Arthur Clennam, if he is at all? Does Little Dorrit have a parallel? How is London, free London, like the Marshall Sea, like the English, like the countryside here outside of Marseille? I want to take this opportunity that I have to talk about one of my favorite things that's invested in reading Dickens, which is namely his relationship with his illustrators. Not all of Dickens' novels were illustrated. Um, in particular, one might think of Great Expectations and how that affects things, Hard Times as well. But primarily, from Pickwick on through Tale of Two Cities, Dickens had a primary illustrator, a man named Hablot Knight Brown, who took the nickname Fizz. And together they experienced great success. Often a monthly number would come with two different plates that uh, Fizz had illustrated. And by illustrated, I mean he made woodblock carvings. Late in their career, when they were doing Bleak House, which is before uh, Little Dorrit, he invented a technique called the dark plate, in which you have really a dark, dark, dark surface that illustrates somebody kind of through a reverse highlight. Rather than, and we'll look at two of these examples in a moment. And he uses this technique again to great effect in Little Dorrit. Some people argue that the plates of Little Dorrit are of less quality, and they'll point to the fact that Fizz doesn't actually sign any of them, which is always interesting. If you look at an early one, he'll have signed them all. Um, but one of the things I want you to think about is the difference between reading the novel in a monthly number versus, uh, by which I mean serialized, as opposed to reading it as though you've just purchased it. 
Each monthly number would have this cover on it. This monthly number would have appeared on top of each illustration, and, or each edition that you got. And it's largely metaphorical. Although you'll notice, you can probably spot Mrs. Clenham, you can see different elements of decay. And largely, one of the ways to think about this is, you're going to have this monthly number for an entire month. You're going to reread the sections several times, and you're going to look at this illustration and think to yourself, oh, I now know who that character is, or I think this is a way to interpret this. And so it becomes this way to engage with the text, even when it's just casually lying around on your side. Once you buy the book, however, and we can use, for example, my edition of Bleak House in order to do this. If you buy the two volume set, you'd open it up and you'd have what's called a frontispiece on one side, a piece of onion skin, and then the title page. This is what you have in your edition of Little Dorrit. And so then you can compare how the frontispiece shows Little Dorrit uh, entering a house that we have not seen yet, juxtaposed strongly with her exiting the Marshall Sea, thereby asking us to compare what these two have in common, these two situations. Notice in particular with the Marshall Sea how the light seems to be coming in from the prison and then exiting. However, to take, for example, two different illustrations that we had from this February number that I've been talking about. In the first one, we see kind of a so-called light plate. Here we have Arthur, Maggie, and Little Dorrit. Little Dorrit in between the two, and her size is emphasized by the large stature of both Maggie and Arthur. In particular, I love the detail of her small shoes and of the potatoes that are in the basket. The other plate, though, is a so-called dark plate, and here we see Cavaletto making his escape. You can see the sun rising over the city in the distance. And the thing I want to emphasize about these two plates is how they go together. Both of them are outside. If you look at the plates that we've encountered, the illustrations so far, they are all interior spaces, all different types of prisons. And this last one, with Cavaletto in particular, shows him fleeing, escaping any kind of prison and rushing off into nature. So one question with which I want to leave you before you continue on and concern yourself with illustrations is, do they just illustrate a text? That is, do they take a sentence in Dickens and then show that explicitly in a visual form? Or do they challenge the text? Do they work against the text or in addition to it to help nuance our meaning? And so I'll leave you with that, and I hope you've enjoyed this February number. It's really majestic, and it deals both with character and with institutions, at which point Dickens begins to merge them in a really magical way. So enjoy your reading, and carry on. <laughs>